All right, well, hello everybody again. And in this fourth lecture, we're going to finish off really the discussions about enthalpy, uh, just finishing up with enthalpy of physical change. So, so far we've been talking about chemical reactions uh, and looking at, for example, how we quantify enthalpy change in chemical reactions. So we had um, a reaction calorimetry and bomb calorimetry. Today I want to look at enthalpy of physical change and how we quantify that, what that means, um, and experimental techniques, some really powerful experimental techniques on measuring those kind of enthalpies. And then that sort of leaves us finishing the first law of thermodynamics and entering the second law of thermodynamics and introducing a concept called uh, entropy. So where were we? Well, we were talking about chemical transformations. We were talking about combustion of substances. And for example, in our screaming jelly baby reaction, and we can see that we are getting chemical transformations. The chemical molecular structure uh, here is completely changing in in this reaction, in this chemical reaction. But of course, there are different types of um, chemical transformation. Sorry, there are different types of transformations. Not all of them are chemical. So here, in our chemical transformation, we can see very visually we're getting um, a change in substances. But we can also have a physical change. And of course, uh, you all know very well um, this kind of um, diagram. And as I mentioned at the start of this course, I'm sitting in the Joseph Black Building recording this lecture course. And the man behind um, studying this is indeed Joseph Black. Uh, and, and he was the first person to observe this phenomenon that when we, for example, increase a solid and measure the temperature of that solid as we're increasing. OK, so here on the x-axis here is the amount of heat that we are providing. And on the y-axis is the temperature of the substance as we heat it. And Black observed, and we've been observing ever since, that, of course, as we heat a substance, its temperature will increase. But then we'll reach a point where the temperature stops increasing, even though we continue to heat it. So this is now distinguishing between heat and temperature. We are providing heat, but the temperature is no longer increasing. And, of course, at that point, we have the solid undergoing a physical transformation. It is undergoing a transformation from being a solid to being a liquid, a process that we call uh, melting in common parlance or fusion in uh, thermodynamic parlance. And then we're at the stage again where we will continue to heat the substance. And uh, as we heat it, we are heating liquid, for example, liquid water. We are heating it, and it will reach a point again where we continue to provide heat but now, as we provide this heat, the temperature doesn't change. And you can see here is a much larger amount of heat needs to be provided before the temperature starts to change again. And there we're reaching a point where the substance is boiling. So the temperature that we are providing to it um, is, sorry, the heat that we are providing to it is not increasing the temperature. And then at the end of that process, we reach a point where it has all become a gas. And as we increase the temperature, we we're increasing the kinetic energy of that gas. So um, sorry, as we provide more heat, I should say, we're increasing the kinetic energy of that gas and the temperature increases. So, of course, what's happening here is we are ripping apart intramolecular forces. So if we have ice, ice is a solid structure and the water molecules are fixed in position. And as we are providing heat to this, it, they're vibrating more and more and more until eventually they can break away from each other. There are still some intramolecular forces, so as a liquid, liquid molecules of water are still strongly hydrogen bonded to each other, but they can be flexible. They will hydrogen bond with one molecule and then instantaneously move on to another molecule and so on. But they still remain that liquid property of staying in close proximity until the point at which we reach a gas. And at that point, we are providing enough heat to completely rip apart those hydrogen bond um, interactions. And we are pulling those molecules away from each other completely, and they are essentially free individual molecules um, that do not have any interactions in an ideal sense with each other uh, and, and become a gas. And I guess the reason we can talk about the extent of um, this amount of heat that we have to provide here in boiling compared to in melting gives us, gives us a way or a sense or an indication of the strength of intermolecular forces that exist in this in this molecule, in this case water, is a very strongly bound liquid molecules, um, the strongly strong inter intermolecular forces that need to be overcome before we can before this molecule become before this substance becomes a gas.
So therefore we can talk about uh, the processes solid going to liquid and liquid going to gas. We can label those as thermodynamic processes. Okay, We are interested in the amount of energy of before and after, um, so therefore we can talk about enthalpy changes. So the process in going from a solid to a liquid, as I mentioned, is called melting in common parlance, but we tend to call it fusion in thermodynamics. So this is the enthalpy of fusion in going from a solid to a liquid. The enthalpy of vaporization in going from a liquid to a vapor. That would be that difference in enthalpy provided there. And Hess's law says the enthalpy of sum of a series of steps is equal to the enthalpy of the overall step. So we also have something like uh, carbon dioxide, sublimes from a solid directly to a gas at normal pressures. So therefore we could say that the sublimation enthalpy will be the sum of fusion and vaporization. So these are common uh, enthalpies of physical change, fusion, vaporization and sublimation. Of course we have, the, we have the reverse processes and they will also have enthalpy labels uh, and their signs will be the opposite signs of, the, of these processes. So we can say then that we have vaporization, okay, and here you see I'm putting the label before the enthalpy sign so that vaporization is a liquid going to a gas Obviously, we need to provide energy to a liquid to vaporize it from a liquid to a gas. So that process is obviously endothermic. The reverse process, a gas going to a liquid, so if you think of uh, steam against a window, that is condensing on the window, um, so that's called condensation, and that's exothermic. W where is that energy coming from? Well, if we think of a gas molecule has very high kinetic energy, and when it deposits on a surface and becomes a liquid, well, it has to liberate all of that very high kinetic energy that it has as it becomes a liquid. So this is exothermic, that energy has been given off. Similarly for fusion, solid going to a liquid, obviously to melt a solid, we have, it's endothermic. Freezing, a liquid going to a solid, exothermic. Again, all of that motion that the liquid had as a liquid needs to be liberated to the surroundings as it becomes a solid. Sublimation, a solid to a gas, and deposition, a gas to a solid. So this is pretty straightforward, but I want you to really think and check that you understand why each of these processes are endothermic or exothermic. Remember, we're talking about the difference between the change in energy in system to surroundings. So what, wh where is heat being given off to, and, and wh why is that heat being given off in exothermic situations? And similarly, for endothermic situations, what has the heat been provided for? What, that actually, what is actually happening in, in the chemical system? All right, so as I mentioned, Hess's law still applies, so we can, we can combine any arrangement of these processes um, to, uh, if we know two out of three of any of these processes, we can work out the third. You see here, we tend to only label the processes solid to liquid to gas, okay? So here we say sublimation, fusion, vaporization. We tend not to write labels here for condensation, deposition, freezing. Um, um, we can do, but we, but we tend to just write them as the negative of the of the forward processes. So as as I mentioned, this this forward process in solid going to liquid going to gas is the provision of energy to start to start to um, break apart and eventually rip completely apart those intermolecular forces. The process of liquid gas going to liquid going to solid is that very high kinetic energy having to be liberated to the surroundings as the molecules slow down um, and going from gas to liquid to solid. So that's why the um, process on the left here are all uh, endothermic and the process on the right are uh, exothermic. Okay, so we can get a sense of the extent of enthalpy of vaporization, for example. If vaporization is turning a liquid into a gas, but well, obviously the stronger these intermolecular forces, the larger the enthalpy of vaporization. And when we look at something like um, water and uh, mercury and ethanol, we see that they have very high enthalpies of vaporization, and that's because they have very, very strong intermolecular forces, compared to something like methane, where the only intermolecular force is uh, London forces, um, ammonia, very small, um, uh, there's a polar force here, but essentially quite a, quite a, a weak force. So we can get a sense of 
from enthalpies of vaporization, this is essentially an indirect measure of the extent of uh, intermolecular forces. So the stronger the intermolecular forces are, um, the larger the enthalpy of vaporization will be. Obviously, if we have to rip apart molecules as liquid to become gas, the, the amount of energy you have to provide to rip them apart obviously depends um, on the strength of those forces. Okay, and we can use this concept now to start thinking about how we measure enthalpies of physical change. And what I want to tell you about, after a cup of tea, is differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC. Before I do that, I just want to just mention, we can do, so you may have come across in school what we call electrical calorimetry. And this is where you would add some ice to a beaker of water. And we will provide that beaker of water uh, using a, a, an element or a heating element or something like that with an amount of current at a particular voltage for a period of time and measure how long it took to melt a known mass of ice. So therefore we will be able to work out the heat being given to that known mass of ice, current times voltage times time, and work out how much heat was required to measure, say, a gram of ice, and therefore work out the enthalpy of, um, of fusion of that gram of ice and then convert it to a mole. So that's a, that's a very trivial way of looking at enthalpies of phase changes. Differential scanning calorimetry is essentially that idea, but just is a little bit more, um, a little bit more involved. It's a very, very powerful technique. So this is the differential scanning calorimeter. Calorimeter. Yeah. Um, so this is probably about the size of a microwave. And you can see here, just in this little metal container, there's this, there's this holder that holds two little pans. All right, so there's two little areas here to hold two little crucibles or pans. And in each of those crucibles, uh, we, pr we put in a substance. So we put in our sample that we want to um, study in the right-hand side. And we put in a reference or just leave blank. Um, the left hand side and then we heat up both of these substances okay so we have our sample here in this, in this box on the right and our reference on the left so this is on the right here and on the left so we heat them both up so this this notation here is essentially re referencing the fact that there are heaters and as we heat them up let's say some endothermic event happens let's say the sample starts to melt well as we are measuring the temperature of these substances, so we are measuring the reference pan, we are measuring the sample pan, as we measure the temperature, we'll find that the temperature of the sample pan stops increasing as it's going through that phase change, whereas the temperature of the reference pan just keeps going up. Okay, So the temperature of the sample levels off as it's undergoing some enthalpy of physical change. So the DSC, depending on the, on the type of DSC it is, will do two things. It'll just measure essentially the amount of extra energy that's been provided, or it'll dial down, it'll turn down what's called power compensated DSC. It'll turn down the power in the sample pan until, um, sorry, it'll turn down the power on the reference pan so that the temperatures return to be the same. So it'll know how much power it had to reduce um, by the, the reference by to keep the temperature the same as a sample. And that will, be, that will relate to the amount of energy that, had to, that was uh, um, being provided to the sample uh, during that process. All right, so let's just talk through that again. We will have our, our um, uh, energy being provided to our sample and our reference, and we'll find at a particular point that some event happened in our sample. And as that event happens, we will be able to measure the difference in that event compared to the reference pan, because nothing will be happening there. So we'll be able to measure the difference there between the sample and the reference. What we're actually measuring here is the heat capacity at constant pressure, what we talked about the last time, this CP value, this molar heat capacity. What this is, is essentially how well is heat flowing through this substance. And what we find is that as we measure the heat capacity at constant pressure as a function of temperature, well, we get this we get this kind of curve, and as we know from Kirchhoff's law, Kirchhoff's law says the enthalpy change is the integral of CPDT, so essentially the area under this curve is our enthalpy. So DSC is so powerful because it allows us very readily determine 
the enthalpy change for any um, enthalpy um, of reaction, especially especially physical transformations. Okay, so we have we, we know from the last lecture that Kirchhoff's law says the enthalpy change is the integral of CPDT. So this is essentially the, the area under this curve. So all we have to do in our instrumentation is just click here at the onset temperature, in other words, the temperature that an event starts happening. Click here when the sample and reference um, return to be the same point, and the computer associated with the instrument will give us the area under this curve, which Kirchhoff's law says is the enthalpy change. And um, once we know the mass of substance in the sample, we can work out the enthalpy change as a function of temperature. This is really useful for looking at enthalpies of physical change. And I want to mention two particular areas that is especially useful um, industrially. The first is um, studying what's called polymorphism. So polymorphism is where you may have a crystal structure that can exist, that you may have a substance that can exist as a crystalline structure, but it can exist in different forms. The crystalline structure can be different forms. So you may have a crystal structure that's cubic, or a crystal structure that's rhombic, in other words, a slightly tilted one way, or hexagonal, or whatever. So the molecules in the crystal may arrange in different forms. And these different forms are called polymorphs. And in the pharma pharmaceutical industry, polymorphs, or poly, what's called polymorphism, the changing, the change of a crystal structure from one type to another, is really, really important, because some, some materials, their crystal structure may be active, as a pharmaceutical ingredient, what's called API, but some may be inactive. So a standard pharmaceutical test is to determine whether or not at a particular temperature, so for example, a drug being stored on a pharmacy shelf for a year, what temperatures will that be exposed to? The, um, the standard test is to run a DSE of that and see whether or not it, it, it changes, whether or not it's a polymorph. So here, the physical change is not from one phase to another. We're not going from a solid to a liquid or to a gas. But the, the, there is some change in the orientation within the structure, which does require some energy. So DSC here, you can see this curve, this lower curve, at, a, at about 150, 60, about 170 degrees Celsius, this substance is undergoing some transformation. Okay, and this is actually a... Um, um, an API uh, acetaminophen, which is undergoing a um, change so that it goes from one crystal form to another. And we can work out from the area under that curve what that is. So DSE is a really useful way of exploring uh, any physical changes that the uh, substance undergoes as a result of temperature. Another very common example is uh, in, the, in the polymer industry or the plastic industry. And this is where we take, so here, for example, I have a plastic pen. It is rigid, obviously. If I was to heat this up, I'd eventually reach a temperature in which it would become very flexible. It wouldn't be a liquid, so it's not melting, but it just becomes much more flexible. So if you think of a rubber tube, for example, a, a, um, um, the, the orange rubber tubes associated with Bunsen burners, they're very flexible, but if you were to cool them down to a certain temperature, they'd become very rigid. So it's a point at which plastics go from being very rigid to being very flexible. And that point is called the glass transition temperature. And it is crucial for every single plastic that's manufactured so that we know about its usability what the glass transition temperature is. We need to know whether or not the, um, the substance becomes, if it's flexible, if it becomes rigid at a certain temperature, or if it's rigid, if it becomes flexible at a certain temperature. So this glass transition temperature, which you see, is an unusual transition in the DSE. It's a step from one heat flow to another, whereas all other transformations tend to return back to some baseline. The glass transition temperature is a, is a step, and that's because there's this permanent change in heat flow through the substance. Determining the glass transition temperature is enormously important. And the very tragic example of this is the uh, Challenger shuttle disaster, where there were um, polymeric rings essentially um, connecting bits of the fuselage um, with each other. And as the spacecraft went into the outer atmosphere, the temperature changed dramatically and, and their, their chemical properties changed and there was, a, there was a, an oxygen leak to, a, to an ignition source. Okay, so, so DSC is a very useful way of thinking about how crystalline forms change, how a substance goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas, 
or this unusual case of glass transition, how it changes from one type of solid material to another, or more flexible solid material, but still, still quite flexible. You can see we can very easily find study these, and in cases where it's a, it's a peak, find the enthalpies associated with those. All right, so that's essentially the first major section of the course where we have looked at the heat, work, and uh, the first law of thermodynamics. Oh, tea. So what I wanted to move on to now is the second law of thermodynamics because all of our considerations so far have been about uh, energy transformation. We have been thinking about, we have reactants going to products, will there be an energy increase? Or will there be an energy decrease? Do we need to provide a reaction with energy? Or do, will a reaction just give off energy? And that is a major consideration in considering the feasibility of energetic re and, and, uh, feasibility of reactions, whether or not it is energetically feasible. What that means is, do we have to, if, if we think, look at a chemical reaction and think, will this reaction proceed? Obviously, looking at the energetics of it, in other words, how much energy is required or how much energy be given off, gives us a major hint as to whether or not a reaction will proceed. However, there is another consideration. And this other consideration, okay, so we have enthalpy is the first consideration. This other consideration is entropy. And entropy gives us a, um, a, um, a description on not just energy considerations, but how the distribution of energy changes from reactants to uh, products. So entropy can be best described uh, in general terms as something like this. If we imagine our bouncing ball, so our ball is bouncing and r r right at this point it has a high amount of kinetic energy and all of the energy is stored in a limited number of combinations in this, in this ball when it's in the air. As that ball bounces, so it bounces and hits off the ground, it's going to pass some energy to the surroundings. So when, when it does, the amount of energy that's all sort of going in one direction um, in, in, in let's say the z direction down towards the surface hits the surface and now suddenly the kinetic energy that was in the ball translates into potential energy and, and therefore and again back into kinetic energy in the substance and goes in all kinds of directions. So we go from a situation where the ball had energy that can go in very few, it was arranged in very few combinations, to energy that's arranged in a, a large number of combinations. So as the ball bounces, it's passing more and more energy to the surface and it has less and less energy. So eventually the ball will bounce less and less and less and then stop bouncing. We never, of course, have a situation where the ball bounces off the surface and picks up, up, picks up from energy from the surface and bounces higher. The bouncing always gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that direction, that direction of energy transformation underpins the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? The direction here is always towards increasing the distribution possibilities of the energy. The distribution possibilities of the energy here were very limited in, in the ball. All, all of the, all of the the, all of the direction of this energy is all going in one direction, it's all following the line here of the bounce. Once it hits the surface, suddenly all of those energy combinations have many more possibilities and the distribution of that energy is now much larger, it's able to go in all kinds of directions in the surface. That direction, that, that sort of uh, drive towards increasing the number of energy possibilities is essentially our um, uh, our uh, way that we describe this uh, un underpinning driving force of distribution of energy. So you may have come across entropy before and thought about it as disorder. And that's an easy way of thinking about it, but it's slightly limited. Really what we want to think about is entropy as a, a, the number of ways energy can be distributed. Okay, so the energy value doesn't change, but the way it's distributed does. So here, remember the... the um, Zero's law of thermodynamics says the, en the uh, um, energy, um, sorry, the law of conservation of energy uh, says the amount of energy doesn't change, but the distribution of that energy does. So we're moving from a situation where the distribution of energy is quite narrow here to where it bounces and suddenly it's able to pass off a lot of that energy. The distribution of, th of that energy is much larger. And we call this distribution, we give it this value, the number of possible arrangements, we give it this value uh, W.
And therefore we define entropy as essentially a way of expressing the number of those distribution possibilities. So entropy, given the symbol capital S, state function, is equal to the Boltzmann constant. Okay, so remember uh, when we were talking about the equipartition theorem, we introduced the Boltzmann constant. The concept is related, of course. The equipartition theorem was thinking about the number of possibilities on which a molecule could move. Okay, so same thing here. We're thinking about the number of possibilities that energy can be distributed um, times the natural log of this of this W value, this number of possible configurations. In chemistry, we tend not to use this very much, but it's important to know where entropy comes from. It's coming from the number of possible configurations uh, of a system where the energy doesn't change. All right, the energy, we're not thinking about energy change here. That's the job of enthalpy in the first law. Here we're thinking of energy distribution. So obviously the larger the number of distribution possibilities, the greater the value of the entropy. Okay, so the larger W is, the larger lin W will be, and therefore the larger S will be. So, uh, we, we are talking about this being, there being a natural driving force to this increasing number of possibilities. Okay, so as I said, the, when the ball bounces here, it doesn't pick up energy. The energy that's in the surface doesn't distribute back into the ball and push the bounce higher. The, the energy always distributes towards increasing the number of um, um, distribution possibilities. And what that means is then there's this natural driving force leading towards increasing the distribution possibilities um, of energy. And we call this spontaneity. We call this a spontaneous process, one, where there is one which has a natural tendency to occur. Okay, so the obvious ways of doing this are water always flowing down a hill or heat always going from hot to cold. Okay, the, that this is essentially increasing the number of possible configurations of the energy in each of those processes. And therefore, the, this natural driving force, or this spontaneous direction, is always moving towards a more distributed configuration of the available energy. In other words, increasing the value of the entropy. We're increasing the value of W, and hence increasing the value of the entropy. So a spontaneous change is one where we're continually increasing that distribution. So therefore, a spontaneous process is where the final state has a higher number, a higher distribution of energy compared to the initial state. So therefore, delta S final minus initial will be positive. So we say for a spontaneous process, delta S is positive. All right, so that is quite a lot packed in there. But really, the major message is we are thinking about energy and its distribution. Okay, You might want to think about it casually as disorder, but it's a little bit more um, um, nuanced than that. We're thinking about how many possible um, combinations there are for energy to be distributed in a molecule. So if we think about a mole molecules as a solid and molecules as a gas, but molecules as a gas would have many more translational energy levels available to it, so therefore the energy will be able to distribute across many more translational levels, so it will have a higher entropy than the molecules as a, subs as a solid. So we can we can think about we can think about describing this in chemistry. We use what are called standard molar entropies. All right. So these derive from the number of possible combinations, um, but they're a way of thinking about um, essentially the distribution of energy in, a, in chemical substances. And we can see the standard molar entropies of gases is very much higher than the standard molar entropies of liquids, which is in turn very much higher than the standard molar entropies of solids. If we look at something like diamond, a highly organized material where the um, extent of distribution of energy is very limited compared to something like um, hydrogen or carbon dioxide, where there are many more possibilities because of the vibrations and translations and rotations of the molecule, there are many more possibilities for energy to be distributed in those molecules. So we, we see that these standard molar entropies, in other words, the entropy that one mole of substance has um, under, under, at, at one bar pressure is very much higher for solids than it is for liquids, and certainly than it is for solids. And of course, what we're interested in chemistry is not the values themselves, but how the values change as a result of some chemical reaction. So just like we did for enthalpies of formation, we can work out entropies of reaction, 
how the reaction entropy changes by taking away the standard molar entropies of reactants, taking that away from the standard molar entropies of products. We're interested in products minus reactants all the time. So it's very easy to work out the entropy of reaction by, by using tabulated values of standard molar entropies, just like we use just the same approach that we did for enthalpies of formation. And just like we did for enthalpy, we can also think about entropy and temperature. So of course, as we increase a substance, the temperature of a substance, we are increasing the possibility of that substance to occupy higher energy states. Okay, so in, in Dr. Bailey's course, you've heard all about energy levels and so on, but there are, there are, as well as electronic energy levels, there are vibrational energy levels, translational energy levels, and rotational energy levels. So obviously, the greater the temperature of the substance, the more possible energy levels it can occupy. So as we increase the temperature, we can um, occupy those um, higher energy levels. So therefore, for a substance, even though its phase might not change, it will have a higher entropy. So we can figure out the entropy delta S at the higher temperature for a reaction by looking at its entropy at the lower temperature and again considering how the heat capacity changes. Here the formula is slightly different to Kirchhoff's law just because of the derivation, but it's essentially the same, the same concept. We can work out the entropy change at a higher temperature by looking at the entropy change at the lower temperature and adding on this effect of changing heat capacity due to um, the temperature change. And we can see that as we increase the temperature of substances, the entropy is obviously increasing because we are occupying, we are providing the opportunity to occupy or distribute um, many more, um, the, distribute the energy across many more configurations. This leads to a logical conclusion that if we to decrease the temperature, okay, so here I'm increasing the temperature, look at this graph, I'm increasing the temperature. Obviously, if we decrease the temperature, we must reach a point where the rotations and vibrations, excuse me, and translations of the molecule decrease to almost and then eventually zero. If we give a substance no energy whatsoever, well then there is no possibility of distributing that energy across any combination apart from the state in which it exists. So the third law of thermodynamics says the entropy of a perfectly crystalline material at zero Kelvin is zero. And this is a little bit like the idea of uh, enthalpies of formation when we're talking about enthalpies. This is giving us a benchmark statement, allowing us to calibrate essentially the entropies of substances because as soon as we start to increase the temperature, well then we're starting to increase the entropy. However, there, there are something called third law entropies. And this is beyond the scope of this course, but just to introduce the term for those of you continuing on with chemistry. The reason we say perfectly crystalline material here is that obviously if we take a material and start to cool it down, so here I have a material where it's carbon monoxide, as I start to cool this down it's going to go from a gas to a liquid and eventually to a solid. And if all the carbons and oxygens line up, well then there is no dis difference in the energy distribution because they will all be in exactly identical environments. But let's say one CO uh, freezes in a different configuration. So here I've drawn it upside down. Well then in this case the energy, there, there is more than one possible distribution of energy, so therefore the entropy of this substance will be slightly higher than the energy of the perfect crystal, the entropy of the perfectly crystalline substance, and we call these um, third law entropies. So again, this is not really for this course, but it's just to relate it on to exactly what we we're talking about in enthalpy when we talked about standard enthalpies of formation. Okay, so we can we can um, just finish that off. Um, so just to go through some review questions, you might think about ordering these in according to increasing entropy. So here we have a solid, a gas, and a liquid. So you can think about well, how might they, um, uh, what what might the uh, entropies of those values be, but especially why might they be different? And then thinking about chemical reactions, why might this chemical reaction? Um, uh, um, sorry, how might this chemical reaction change in energy? How might this uh, physical um, transformation change in entropy? Sorry, not ent energy, entropy. Okay, so uh, um, I think I have the answers here actually on, on the screen, so if you want to pause and have a think about that, you can, but obviously uh, the entropy from what we're saying of a solid is less than the entropy of a liquid. 
which in turn is less than the entropy of a gas. Here we are increasing the entropy. We are going from a solid to a gas. So therefore there are many more energy distribution possibilities in this substance. And of course we're also forming two substances out of one. So the energy distribution possibilities are much larger in the products here than the reactants. So products minus reactants give us a positive delta S. Here we are going from ions in a solution to forming crystals. So the uh, possibility of um, energy distribution is reducing. So we're going from a situation where we had lots of ions in solution floating around, high translational energy and so on, to a solid where they're all fixed in place and probably a highly organized solid. So the entropy change here is decreasing. Okay, so if you remember the last lecture you had started off, the, sorry, the, the puzzle at the end of the last lecture was starting off this, so you might want to continue on this, um, uh, this question now and have a go at that um, as a review and I'll put the answers up on there. And the next time we'll pick up on continuing this discussion of entropy and bringing it together with en enthalpy to answer the fundamental question of this course, which is how do we know whether or not a chemical reaction will proceed?